Before talking to you, I should try to tell you how I think about what I'm going to try to say today. You have all probably had the experience that when you're in a conversation with Pete and you're in resonance, you say, I can see so clearly what's the most important thing to say. And then he sends you off and says, OK, put something together and deliver it in an orderly way. And you go back into the world of your own isolation and you say, now what do I do? You know, the whole world is open to us. Where do we start? So it puts you in the position of Burden's famous ass, who's hungry and thirsty and equidistant between the water and the hay and dies of both hunger and thirst because he can't decide which way to go. <laughs> so my remarks today are basically an arbitrary commitment to something. Right? Think about the phonemes in languages. No language has all the phonemes in the world's languages because in order to be a language, you have to leave enough space between the things you include by excluding everything else that it's possible to make distinctions. So in trying to reorient and get my head out of the fog and back into Y House talking to Pete yesterday, I was thinking, OK, we have these modules, nature, culture, technology, reflection, and action. What happened to awareness? And Pete says, awareness is the wrapper that goes around all of it. So, and this can be sort of awareness sensus teto as just cognition in an almost computational sense, all the way up to the big problems of what the nature of self is or of consciousness. And so it's in that large sense that we want to cast this. Why should that question have a nature module? And I apologize, I'm going to do something I hate to do which is kind of read to you. The problem is it's very hard to choose words that say what you mean, and I don't have a lot of time, so I'm not going to try to wing it today, because I don't want to leave things out or forget them. So a lot of people have recognized in trying to think about what life is or what cognition is that the seeds and primitives of what become cognition were brought into existence already in the earliest stages of life. So the notions of making distinctions of computing. And so for people who try to identify things through their properties, this has created a conundrum. In our common language, we have different words that are sort of centered on different domains of concepts. And yet, as we try to look at them precisely, the reasons for those distinctions start to get lost in all of the particulars that they have in common. So what we were trying to do in, in conversations between us over the last year is to say, OK, what can we distill out of the, the successful sciences of the natural world that has something to contribute to structuring this conversation? So one of the things that, for the sake of today, <coughs> I'm willing to, to put forward is the idea that in the sciences of matter, so the origin of space and time, the vacuum, the matter in the vacuum, and then all of the states of matter, there's a kind of a foundation of innovation which was not obvious and which we had no formal way to think about until it came to us from behind in describing particular things. That's something that physics, chemistry, and biology should be contributing to a more integrative science. Now, beyond the successful parts of understanding matter, we have new problems like the origin of life. And this is where we get into the idea that the seeds of cognition are already there in life. Why do we have two words? Where do we want to put the differences? So on the third point here, people will often take dogmatic positions for reasons that I don't understand. There will be those who will say we should find whatever, make, whatever constitutes the essence of some common language word. What is life? What is cognition? What is consciousness? And then there are other people who will say no. To be empirical, you have to be a property person. And because the attempts at essences always get blunted as the properties are shared, that shows that the effort to find essences was misguided. I don't see it that way. I think we're in the early phenomenological stages of a science where I'm using phenomenology not as philosophers do, but as physicists do, where we have rough and approximating languages that capture pieces of problems. But we don't yet have a consistent reasoning system that shows what role each of them plays. So one of the conversations I hope we will have sometime this morning is from what we think about life and cognition and awareness, what can we say that should get us in the ballpark of where the centers of these ideas are at the same time as recognizing that their components are often shared? Stepping back, though, 
um, to the natural sciences, which will be the source of most of what I say because about them I can speak precisely. I think we can talk about the primitives of the introduction of order into the universe or into our understanding of the universe that had some non-obvious roots, some of which took us centuries to discover in the natural sciences. They were learned outside the domain of cognitive studies, but as we try to understand the emergence of the elements of cognition or individuality or whatever, we often seem to find the same primitives recapitulated in a different substrate. So it's worth trying to articulate what we know about some of those to see which of them may have some use. So let me start with the issue of novelty as we understand it in the other natural sciences and then look at how that reflects on the character of the emergence of novelty in our state of knowledge about the world or in what we build as social cognitive practice and what developmental trajectories that creates for us as forming humans because there are new things that come into being in both of those domains as well. For the sake of this conversation, let's suppose we focus on the idea that the theory of matter as it's currently understood is a kind of story or narrative of how modes of order that were latent or potential in what we call the laws of nature but had never been instantiated came to be real instantiated properties of the material universe. Non-trivial how that came about. Um, as we look at the, ad, the, the transitions through which new kinds of order come into existence in life, in learning, where that can be human cognition, but it can also be computational learning, in the emergence of algorithms and the structure of process, or in the things that we put in informal language behind the concept of mind. Often, if you're a physicist, I don't think this is just seeing everything as a nail because you had a hammer. I think there are questions that go unasked where in physics you look at them and you say, I think there are non-trivial conditions of possibility for that to have happened that the people in the domain are not yet asking. And we can try to introduce those questions. Just like we used the terms particle for a long time without having a meaning for them. And it was only after solving questions that looked unrelated that we first built a concept of particle and then reattached the name to it anew. So I know that the condition of possibility is a technical term that the existentialist philosophers use. I don't make any pretense of having a command of all the discourse that they build around it. But I think just as Kant was trying to understand the role of space and time, in a generation when the physics available to him could not possibly have allowed him to do that. The meaning is essentially the same as his, that the set of things that come into existence are rare compared to those you might imagine are possible, and it's a technical matter when they are enabled and when they're not. So question that maybe the nature module of Y House can allow us to pursue is, what parallel dynamics do we see when we study a new kind of order that is brought into existence in the material universe. Um, the first stage in which we go from not having a perception or an understanding of that order to having something we would call. So having something in us or in our discourse that is in some way faithful to the nature of order in the thing that we're trying to understand or to describe. And then in this idea that Pete likes to call the innovation circle, how we begin to build social cognitive practice to overcome the limits and the illusions that are inescapable within a human mind or within a human's perception, but then which become measuring devices or thinking devices to allow us to see beyond what we would see with our own native abilities. So stepping now beyond sort of laws of nature in general, to things that come up particularly when you try to understand how you go from a world without life to a world where the biosphere is part of that system. I would argue that a lot of the properties that set life apart from the categories that were existence in a universe before life was part of it concern changes in the way local variables carry information. And particularly what I mean is that if all you have is the vacuum and matter 
in some sense, everything is the here and now. And the connection of one here and now to another here and now takes place through all the things that are in between. When you start to have the emergence of individuality, of cognition, of other things like that, the, as a, a stochastic process person would say, the state of the universe carries everything from its history that's relevant to the possibilities for its future. But the architecture of that state can change a lot from one kind of condition to another. And the architecture that's characteristic of that state in the pre-living world does not contain in it the kinds of architectures that exist in a living world. So in the living world, there is a lot in me that is about what's not here, that's what, what is not now, and also what is not me. So can we break down the process for how the physical world needs to form new architectures for that to be possible? Some stages that I think we can identify, uh, for lack of a better word, facultative memory, a little bit of the universe that's not permanently bound to its immediate surroundings, but not permanently isolated from them, but that come, can come into and out of contact, and so can remember things. When it has processes, the emergence of autonomy, that internal degrees of freedom can start to have their own dynamic, not always embedded in cause from their immediate surrounding. And a lot of this is bound up with the role of individuality and the emergence of an evolutionary dynamic in the living world. When you have autonomy and when you have memory, it becomes possible to form representations, so things that reflect or that mimic the not here, the not now, and the not me. And those are sort of entailed in the concept of the emergence of control and feedbacks. And then as you start to become reflective, not only responding to a world with things remembered, but being capable of imagining your own self as a consequence of what you do, you can bring in the concept of agency. Each of these things exist as an abstraction in some body of practice, but there's a lot in ordinary natural science that has not been done to understand when a world that does not require these abstractions to be described changes its architecture so that these become good abstractions and necessary abstractions to describe what's in that world. So let me try um, a kind of a gambit that came up in conversation with Pete yesterday. Of course, Y House is never about any one thing. Y House is about whatever you're talking about with who you're talking about that day. But yesterday at one time with Pete, he says, actually, Y House is all about understanding novelty. So its origin, its nature, its roles, its consequences. Suppose we were to take that as a premise and see what followed from it. I think you could argue, and this, this comes from an observation that Ekosan made a few weeks ago when we were talking about how things that social theorists can see and are looking for formal languages to describe overlap with things that Evo Devo people have also been looking for, for good ways to describe. In a world of static architectures, we do a good job of making a quantitative science because we can guess what the statistical observables should be. And the things that are easy for us to guess tend to be static and stable, so you can get good statistics on them. If we want to start understanding a world where there's change, but the change has structure, we do much less well at guessing what the stable observables should be. And in the absence of a way of reasoning about or systematically working our way toward what those observables should be, we try the naive observables, but they're not stable. So, you know, I take this computer apart, I look at some transistor somewhere in the middle of a chip, and I say, is it zero or one, and what do I learn from that? That's a very, very poor way of understanding what the computer is doing, even though the computer at some level is very simple in its architecture and its purpose. So how do we do better? The trope for this, for this discussion would be to say that the thing that sets cognition apart is that cognition forms to provide a system for responding to events that may have nothing else to do with each other and only form a category in the fact that they're not recurrences of anything. So cognition as opposed to the architectures of static things. So how does then not only the nature module offer to Y House, but how does the nature module grow from Y House? This is a kind of a practitioner's interdisciplinary perspective on the science that I sort of came from, but didn't really belong to exactly. Um, 
physics, chemistry, and biology all inherit in antiquated languages because every human practice does. You're never good at doing what you will now do. You're always good at doing what you did before, which was something else. You can't escape that. But we praise those languages where the phenomena of nature coming from behind us always, where we can't see it, eventually forces us to invent a new language that's faithful to its structure and allows us to tear ourselves away from the antiquated languages. What I wonder when I look at what physicists are doing today, how much are they choosing what they look at in the world according to its ability to fit into the things that they know how to solve? It seems like an awful lot of it to me, and it seems like a lost opportunity. My hope is, it's been this way in Origin of Life, but it extends even more so if we think about the origin of cognition or consciousness or awareness, that there is a new phenomenology that will refuse to be understood in the things that we were already good at solving because it contains surprises that were not uncovered in the phenomena we understood before. How can we be receptive and seek that out instead of resisting it? And in particular, this is where Knowing nothing, I'm optimistic for the collaboration with people from the contemplative traditions. To the extent that they have a system for reasoning about states of mind that draws from a different source from the objectifying language, where can we find new fabrics of languages that were not envisioned? So for instance, suppose I grew up knowing algebra and the character of thinking that comes from syntax as I inherit it from natural language. And someone said, hey, there's this great math called geometry. And suppose I don't have vision. He says, geometry grows out of this sense called vision, and it leads you to see relations among things in the world. And as an algebraist, I say, I just, I don't get it, I don't get it. But then something happens and I begin to see that geometry is not just algebra. Geometry is its own thing. Are there new fabrics that we can find where we've not seen them because there are not overlapping languages? Um, <clears throat> what I can see as an outsider of the nature of awareness debates makes me optimistic that maybe this is something that's missing. And so uh, with trust in each other, maybe there are things we can find. I think that's all there is. So am I in time? Yeah, okay. perfect. Thank you very much. Okay, I put the title as uh, Consciousness and Culture in the Age of Diverse Intelligences. The intelligence is, uh, based, uh, of course, a uh, narrower world than consciousness, but I just have want to say that it is actually the, for the last 20, 20 centuries, we have been actually inclusive to the various uh, minorities, cultures, and diversities. But now we are going to have quite soon with uh, artificial intelligences. So the, in the age of the diverse intelligences, how could consciousness and the culture work? And that is uh, too big in a question. But I want to talk about from the viewpoint of my in part historical research and in part from my most recent uh, autistic uh, people's research uh, today. So the, let me say that at one hand, actually social science has so many uh, different approaches, but some of the basic approaches that actually we focus on structures and processes, and that's actually consistent with uh, some of the challenges in natural sciences that uh, natural sciences also has ch challenges in terms of incorporating both the study of the structures, say structure of brains, the structure of whatever, and also in the activities and processes. And the social scientists also has a problem of incorporating both the study of the social structures and, the, and the also the activities and processes. And the, of course, in a way, in a real reality of the world, fluidity and situational underpinnings of the individuals, situational and, and transitionary nature of the life is more close to that, perhaps, the realities. But we have to talk both ways in order to make more analytically sorry. 
So I want to talk a little bit about then how to consider uh, identity created and recreated from the situ situational contingencies with some networks underpinnings. Network here is a little bit more structured. So the, today I talked about the nature of identities. Identities here I define as primary as uh, not only the individuals and agents, but also including inclusive of the organizations and so forth. Sometimes organization can have the identities. But nonetheless, the identities are not simply, say, isolated agents, but rather identities are coming from the networks. But at the same time, the identity yeah. also influences underpinning networks. Therefore, I, it's uh, in a way both ways. But nonetheless, what I want to today focus on is the notion of public. This sociological concept of the notion of public, again, can be defined just as identities and cultures and all other sociological concepts, can be defined a number of ways, and then, uh, the scholar has a different way of defining it. But what I want today to focus on the, is the network definition of publics. And the focus on spaces and sphere where communications among identities takes place. So here we have public here of the White House. And the individual I, the participants as identities with a baggage of various social networks and cognitive networks behind you. If you have disciplinary backgrounds, associational background, but temporarily, since you are on the public of trying to I understand the White House sort of interdisciplinary approaches, you focus on, uh, on me and try to understand what I'm talking. So tem temporarily decoupling from your existing network in order to couple here with us. So the identity takes place, that kind of interactions, and coupling and decoupling of the networks, individual is moving along with a different, with bringing own networks, but coupling and decoupling, and moving around the ne different publics. So the public is, in a way, empty space, but can, in a way, it's not empty. It holds everything. So it allows you to think through, through interactions. But uh, there are a variety of publics you could think about. Uh, a, from the larger viewpoint, there's a macro social structure that affects where the publics are taking place. This uh, whole institution of the, in America, universities, as a places that hold a free conversation, supposedly, there are different ways of the important institutions that allow to hold a certain public discourses. Those that perhaps you could say the macro level. The metal rebels, they are suppose the smaller rebels, but organizationally supported, institutionally supported publics. There are schools and groups and so forth in the neighborhood that have some organizational or institutional support. And there's a micro face-to-face -face casual contact. The, I know the real publics, real communicative publics of the White House is probably taking place not here, but after the coffee conversations or casual conversations. So face-to-face -face spiritual conversations are very, very productive way of making communications. And then we should not forget about the nano level of publics. We are trying to understand each other, and in your brain, there are internal dialogues going on, so which can be labeled as a nano, nano level publics. So the publics are various kinds of things, but you sh we should not forget about there are something that holds the conversation, holds the communication, the holds the something that you create and devise your own identity through 
constantly participating and moving one to the other different types of fabrics. And we can also think about the interrelationships of the different types of communicative fabrics. Because in a way, if you are born in a poor neighborhood, you move around the different types of public you could think. So that affects your creation of the identities. So the interrelationships among the publics, what kind of the, the in, what kind of publics you are allowed or most likely join and move around and through the career of the moving around the public, you create your own identities, own character, personality, knowledge and so forth. So through, by focus on publics, perhaps we could see the very, in, from the different viewpoints, how the individual character, individual identities are being created. A public sometimes is, um, is described as a metaphor of playground. The playground, the children comes in, comes in and out. And of course, it is the children, the agent, the individual that create what kind of discourse or communication they're making each other. But of course, the teacher can influence the communicative content of the children, and so as just the toys and so forth, how it is placed. So that, in a, in a way, is an equivalent to the say, the, how the environment and social structures condition how the, the publics are being constructed. So the modern life is m moving around the many publics, coupling and decoupling of different types of network connection and constructing and devising our own identities. Well, I don't want to too simple, uh, simplify that, but if we are born in a small village of the some centuries ago, then you are probably stay in a village most of the time and talk with a certain kinds of people all the time and you are born in one religion perhaps. Do not even think about the other ways of value system perhaps. So the modern life characterizes our ability of moving around the different kinds of fabrics and then allowing us to couple and decouple the different ideas. And this is something that the White House is, of course, uh, pro <coughs> producing and hopefully recreating the, the kind of the certain ways of public discourse. Uh, and this culture is, again, it's a kind of difficult to define, but has aspects of common knowledge in public domains. So therefore, actually, you can carry the culture in a larger sense, but each public recreate and create a certain mini culture, which tends to actually influence those individuals who, who interact there. Why have certainly has the certain culture now developing, obviously. So uh, now I go to the <laughs> centuries ago. <laughs> I apply this kind of theories of publics uh, inter, uh, the, as an interactional place that creates a communication, as well as actually the intersecting the networks, the place that intersects the networks. So I go going back to the medieval and early modern Japan, and the how Japanese people are, say, aesthetic. At least you have the image of the, in Japan, aesthetic, a haiku, culture, <coughs> tea ceremony, those things are considered important. It is almost a cliche, but there is a reason. In a macro level of the, the history, until 19th century, Japan was primarily feudalistic, which means that your life is defined by the status, the where you are born and which, what kind of status class you are born into and that limits the way of interacting with others. So it, it sounds like it is very limited in terms of the, uh, the communicative activities. But in, in Japan, actually, they have the kind of niche construction, so to speak, which I learned from Eric, 
of course. And it is a different by using the aesthetic as an excuse. They organize a fun meet meetings. For example, this is a poetry circle, but in fact, actually, the drinking of a sake competition. <laughs> <laughs> And the network is, uh, is a haiku, so they use a different name. The, each po poet usually has a different names as an artist name. And whenever you get into the new hobby, you get the new name, which implies you have different identities, right? So with that disguise of the artist name, they, they can socialize each other horizontally and can have the, this kind of fun meeting of the sake, poetry meeting, but drinking a lot of sake. You will win uh, if you can hold a lot of sake. It is known women join this uh, kind of club. So which is very interesting. As you can see, this is the, making the circle city. This public, communicative public, is a way that actually implying each poet has no status distinction because they are circles. So by using this kind of scheme of aesthetic public, they can sneak in the kind of the way of socializing in a horizontal, they can sit in the same ways, and they can creating the temporary communicative sphere of horizontal socialization. I call it as a bonds of civility. So with the aesthetic procedures of the publics, procedures and rituals are important. It is the rules of culture that allow them so to socialize each other if in an ecosystem as the same artist, same poet, not the samurai, not, not as the farmers. The, in the middle of the field of Japan, where the state of distinction defines a way of socialization, people created the temporary sphere of civility, so the civility as a term, as an equal in a way, uh, and the horizontal socialization. Those aesthetic publics were creating niche publics. So the aesthetic public paves the way the law to construct modernity and civility once Japan opened its door to the world in the late 19th century. So in, during this, the earlier 17th and 18th century, this kind of the niche publics, as aesthetic publics, were in a way enclaves, not political civil societies. But once you get into that kind of club life, so to speak, and every time you move into that club, you differentiate yourself as status of the samurai, or farmer, or merchant, and temporarily created sort of then changing the identity, so to, so to speak, decoupling from the status hierarchy. That, in a way, almost in the eventually objectify taking distance from the something, the formal norms of the feudal societies. So uh, now I'm going to talk about a um, uh, little bit more contemporary. Is this kind of a series of the public, niche publics, to create the intersection of public has a similar phenomena in contemporary society? Of course they are. It's the most obvious thing is the digital world nowadays in a, uh, so <coughs> crazy as it is, I uh, you began to study the Baja world about uh, 10 years ago, and they, this is Kiremimi Taiga Pao, my own avatars, and <laughs> I <laughs> began to study with this uh, avatars, and some of my students are participating with me, to study the people who use, as if it's the haiku poet or tea ceremony practitioners, using the different names and try to make the groups escape from the restriction of the ordinary world. And the, uh, this is my own research institute inside the digital world. 
And then I uh, encountered very interesting phenomena that uh, I met many autistic people. Autism spectrum disorder is considered the problem of the mind, problem of the communicative problem. They cannot read others' mind, supposedly. They cannot, re <coughs> there are so many, so many definitions of the mind of the autistic people. But in the virtual world, I met many autistic people who are extremely articulate and who can express themselves very clearly. They are not a high performer. They are not Einstein. In their own world, sometimes they are working for the grocery stores. Sometimes they are so bright in the virtual world that, but they cannot hold a regular job. But when I was studying with them, uh, actually, with the permission, we attended um, about 100 of uh, virtual world autism support sessions and studied how they talk and so forth. So they talk very natural each other. Interestingly, supposedly, they cannot breathe their mind and they cannot, it is said, uh, sympathize each other. Empathy is a problem support. But in the world of digital world with the avatars, they, they share the room together and there are some world of real sympathies when they talk about the difficulties in their own life. So how do we come up with this? We could, that gave me the autism gave me the very interesting I, the conceptual kind of awakening for me, new type of awareness, and just give me the new insight to study the early or medieval Japan, that is very different from contemporary Japan. Um, the study of autism is really, in a way, eye-opening for me in many respects. It comes to the question of what is mind, what is physics, physical, what is sensory, what is social, and understands autistic world is everything, mind, of course, sensory, physical, as well as social. And it gives me the new insight, for example, to see, even say, if I, when I hear about the sort of the experience of the contemplative practices, because those people, autistic people, see the world in the same way as, not, not the same way, see the same landscape, but sometimes they see it differently. Sometimes they hear the same sound, but they hear differently. That is sometimes, actually, some of the Zen Buddhism, some of the contemporary practices, ask us to question, are you really seeing the world? Are you really feel the world? So by only seeing the different part, different kind of the way of thinking, I began to see that it's a real question. So uh, in re reality, the one of the reasons why they can talk freely is probably primarily about the question of sensory overload. The sensory overload in virtual world is, of course, the, the autistic people have a re very sensitive sensor, sensory perceptions. So they can control their own sensory inputs to them. So one of the avatars said, being able to turn down the sound prevent people coming up to me abruptly, not have movement of the air or smell, pollen, insect sounds, intensity of light, being able to be supported in a chair, not falling down sometimes, physical balance is not so good. Almost all the time, and having to brace myself against object or being horizontal, yet still being able to move in a space and explore. This is coupled with the fact that I seem to communicate far more better 
fluently by a text than I can by speech. So various things that this is an, one of the person who is almost bedridden in, in heavily autistic, but extremely bright, having the chemistry BA in England uh, sort of university, which tend to be better than American, I guess. <laughs> so uh, you can see it's a very bright intelligence, diverse in, in, intelligence, and uh, not necessarily actually all effective in this society. So this brings me a question of the various things. We are getting in the age of diverse I intelligences, and, but of course the autistic people also has um, one of those uh, different style of intelligence. And the under understanding publics, which means the digital public, which allows the autistic people to communicate much more effective. Such things as considering the nature of the public can be not simply the matter of reflection and analysis for the researcher, which is, of course, very important for me, but the matter of action and practice. So uh, recognizing diversity, diversity which has been always very important in uh, the 20th century up to now, in a various diversity, culture, gender, sexual preferences, and the autistic or so-called neurotypical. Uh, Those are the diversities are very important. But how can you create a sphere of niche publics that invite diverse intelligences interacting each other. Only di recognize diversity would make ourselves just as segregated entities in societies. So my studies um, make me think this uh, rather uh, difficult questions. Of course, I don't have the answer, but uh, <laughs> let's perhaps discuss that. Thank you. So yeah, I want to talk about, uh, there's a wonderful paper um, by uh, John Marshall on, on metaphors for the mind. Um, and of course, you all know this stuff. So there was hydraulic metaphors uh, back in the Greeks. Um, think about depression and repression and all the words that Freud used are all basically hydraulic. Stores of objects with memory chambers, you know, the idea of how you memorize things, you stick things in the chambers of the memory. Clockworks were huge, electricity, railways and telephone switches when they came forward. Basically, the point is that when new technologies got developed, people thought, oh goodness, maybe that's how the mind works. <laughs> Some more thoughtful people thought, you know, that's how the mind works, and that's why we invented telephones and <laughs> railways and so on and so forth. Um, Strings and pulleys, the last meditation of Descartes, it's wonderful, he talks about the nerves, it's not too bad except the nerves are actually strings and you pull them through the tube and the foot moves and stuff. Um, and then the computer. Now, the computer was different in terms of its intellectual impact as a possible um, model of mind. It was taken very seriously theoretically. And the question is why? And I think there's a reason, and I want to try to explain that reason. So. To explain it, we have to go back to Descartes again and to the emergence of science, basically, and the philosophy of mechanism. So in the age of alchemy, there were spirits, there were trees, there were you know, ants and so on and so forth. Um, there was rationality, there was having orgasms and stuff. Having an idea and having an orgasm were sort of thought to be the same. It's really wondrous stuff, the hermetic method. But then Descartes came along and kind of sorted things out. And he separated the realms of mechanism and the realms of meaning I think because he understood how he could actually theorize mechanism and he didn't understand how he could theorize meaning, so it was kind of a division of labor. I actually think that this is a more important dualism in Descartes than the mind-body one. I mean, of course, the body is a mechanism according to him and the mind is meaningful, but it was really meaning and mechanism that he was actually separating. And the realm of meaning, you know, he includes things of language and symbols and so on and so forth in there. And uh, mechanism forces, causes, all the stuff we know from mechanics and then dynamics and then chemistry and physical stuff and so on and so forth. Um, 
Our thoughts, our language, our symbols, and so on and so forth are about this world. That's what Descartes was doing. He was coming up with meditations, which were in the top realm, about things in the bottom realm, by and large. You can, of course, think about meaning, too, recursively, but this was the basic picture. Um, there was a little problem for Descartes. Um, so then he gets an A minus on the test. He didn't explain how these two worlds interact. How, if the mind was there, it could interact with the world of physical stuff. That's called the problem of mental causation in philosophy. Um, and I believe one of the most signal achievements in intellectual life in the last 200 years is basically a solution to that problem that was proposed in the foundations of logic. Um, and so I want to kind of tell you about that. So I want to tell you what logic is. One way logic is after I introduced is sort of like this. I actually think that's not a very useful. If you know how to read that stuff, then you know how to read that stuff. I'm not going to tell you anything. And if you don't know how to read that stuff, then I'm not going to tell you anything either because it would fail. I think we need to understand the fundamental idea by long logic. And I think this is really important because I think it's been lost. So what's the fundamental idea? The fundamental idea is that reasoning, thought, derivation, language, and so on and so forth are enacted through a system of symbols. So here we have symbols. I got them in a mind, but they could be in a theorem prover or a machine. That represent the world that the reasoning is about. Planetary motion or what time for breakfast or whatever. There are two relationships between and among the symbols and between them and the world. And they're both critical and they've got to be coordinated. Um, there are causal relationships. Now, they're sometimes called formal relationships, but I've actually spent 30 years trying to understand what formal means, and I actually think I can go to court and argue that actually the notion of syntactic formality is, is, is can be derived from the laws of, of physics. Um, so I've indicated those things on this page with single red arrows. And there's another relationship of aboutness. If I have a thought, I have a thought about the party you're going to invite us all to tomorrow night, or about... Um, you know, the first female president, who I don't even know who it is, but I can still think about her because I want to give her my best wishes, and so on and so forth. Um, so I've indicated in here with two blue double arrows. And the point is that this structure, which was worked out in the context of logic, I believe applies to all representational technology. So this is a hugely general basic picture, which got to be complicated in a zillion ways. But the basic idea, remember we're still talking about the fundamental idea, is that to work properly, the systems, the symbols in the system have to remain appropriately coordinated with the world they refer to. Otherwise you're going to be wrong, for example. That means that logic and all representational systems are governed by norms. So if I come up with a logic in my well, office teaching my logic course, and I say, hey, look, I've got a great new logic. Here's how it works. And Olaf points out, look, everything this thing's coming up with was false. And I said, you're just so prejudicial. What's wrong with falsehood? <laughs> Logic is not arbitrary. It's not arbitrary symbol manipulation. There's actually this background condition in logical systems that you actually are trying to uh, represent, get these things coordinated. And uh, the representation be true is one of the most obvious norms. People who know logic will know about soundness and completeness. Soundness and completeness are technical versions of those norms in the formal structure of logic. But this is what matters. There's a norm. Moreover, having semantics, being about things, and being subject with respect to how you work to those relationships to what it's about, I actually think are the confining properties, the stuff and substance of mind and language. I actually don't think you have a mind or have a language unless you have those properties. Because, in fact, this is what allows us to refer to things that are distal, the party I referred to, or, in fact, Einstein drive out there, or, or anything. In fact, I don't think you can think without actually thinking about something. And what it is that you think about isn't necessarily here. We actually have a sense of the world. And furthermore, the structure of these norms and the structure of the coordination determines whether what we say is true and false, which at the moment seems to be a rather important subject matter, which might be something Whitehouse would be interested in knowing. What's, what is truth, and how does that work, and so on and so forth. I should say I'm a social constructionist of a certain, uh, to, to a certain extent. So this doesn't mean naive realism. It just means there's a world out there. 
Moreover, and I want to emphasize this, I think the most important property of human and logical semantics and reasoning and so on and so forth is that it's deferential. This should have been in italics. We defer to what's the case. If, as the philosophers say, if word and world part company, the world wins, and I'm wrong. I actually um, specialize in being wrong because it's a experience I have a great deal. Um, and I think the point about being wrong is I want to know if that's a pond that is 17 miles deep. And my guess is it's not. And so if I say it's 17 miles deep, people think, why did I invite this guy? Because he said something false. Because what actually matters is how deep the pond is. So that deference, and I think it underwrites artistic creativity and so on and so forth, that deference to how the world is, namely the deference to what it is that our thoughts are about, I think is in fact foundational in logic. And the thing that is most important for Weihaus and for my talk here today and so on and so forth is that these semantic relations and the norms of truth and reference and the deference and so on and so forth, none of them are causal relations. You can't express what's going on, what the norms are, what things are about in purely causal terms. So I'll just tell you about this iPhone app I tell my students about. I say, look, if you could build this iPhone app, you can earn a billion dollars. I mentioned this when I was here last time. Um, if you can't earn a billion dollars, you can take my life. Because I'm sure God will tell you you can't build it. And the iPhone app is the following. You download the iPhone app, you put it on your iPhone, and turn it on, and then your iPhone will beep every time anyone thinks about you. Now, I think that would cater to a large amount of <laughs> ego in the world. But the thing is, when you're thought about, you are actually thought about, but nothing causally impinges on you. You can't have a being thought about detector, because it's not a causal property. It's not a causally efficacious property, I would say, if I was thinking talking more carefully. And I think that fact that the properties of thought and language which are most important are not causally detectable means the following. That you can't understand logic completely within contemporary science because contemporary science is committed to causal explanation. More, I think, I mean, philosophers of science will say that, but I think more than, in fact, some scientists realize how profound the philosophy of mechanism that came out of the, emerged from alchemy, is actually committed to a kind of causal account of how thinking and mind and waterfalls and so on and so forth work. So I think the point is that this fact about logic, that it's governed by semantic norms, which are not themselves causal relationships, means that the actual theory of logic can't actually be given a causal explanation. And of course, I wouldn't be saying this if we were talking about logic. I think this is true about mind. I think it's true of awareness. I think it's true of consciousness. I also think it's true of computing. And I will actually go to back to argue that the things that get called theories of computation are actually inadequate in that they don't get at what actually matters about computation, which is that it's a normally normatively governed configuration of machine states that actually are meant to correspond to the world in, in, in semantic ways, and that the semantic ways and the normal normative coordination and so on and so forth. Every programmer knows that, but the theories don't account for it. All right. So that was this great idea of logic, I think. You work causally, and the way you work is governed by norms that are semantic, and the semantic norms are not themselves causal. All right, what about computing? Let's go back to the picture we had. As the world went on, mechanical, you know, causal scientific accounts of things started to be more and more impressive, and started to take over things that were actually previously thought to be in this realm. So if you think of George Boole's stuff in the middle of the 19th century, um, Frege attempted to derive logic from mathematics, but then what came out of that, um, essentially formal logic. And I think this is a kind of, what do we call it, just so story? I'm not sure people know what just so stories mean anymore, but basically rationalizations that aren't quite right, but they give a sense of what's going on. What I think happened is the intellectual life 
because we started to understand things about theory of language and symbols, it got kind of brought within science. And I think that computing actually arose, so this is the 37 paper of Turing in the 50s, uh, what is, uh, it's 1950, what's the Turing 50 paper called? Anyway, whatever it's called. Game? Sorry? The Imitation Game? Well, it's about the Imitation Game. I don't what think that's its that? name. Um, doesn't matter. Whatever it's called. I'm referring to it. <laughs> and I defer to it, whatever it is called. I think computation arises out of that. Here is a striking fact. Think about computer science's technical vocabulary. Symbol, reference, language, name, identifier, variable, syntax, sint uh, semantics, evaluation, interpretation, and so on and so forth. All of these words are words that come from the study of logic, which was the upper thread in this picture. Those words aren't like force or mass or acceleration or charge or anything like that. They're not words from the realm of causal physical stuff. They're words from the realm of language and symbols and reasoning and thought and so on and so forth. But what happened, I think, is that because of this insertion, computer science actually redefined all those words to name the causal mechanical relations. Now, you might think that what it did was it came up with mechanical accounts of these phenomena. But I don't think that's right. I think it actually changed the subject. And I'll, I'll give you an example in a minute. Um, so what that's led to, I think, is the following. So I wrote my, I don't know if I mentioned this, I wrote my first big AI program um, 50 years ago this October. So I'm basically an agent and about to go extinct. Um, when I started, AI was based on essentially a logical model. Good old fashioned AI, that's what my old friend John Hoagland called, called it. GoFi, that became the, the universal word. It basically was based on this deferential model that the syntax had to honor the semantics and so on and so forth. You had this dialectic. GoFi failed. My own view is it failed because, it's a big, because of its excessively rigid ontology, not because this fundamental model is wrong. But the problem was, people threw away the baby with the bathwater, as always happens. And the two things happened. One is that the AI students and the cognitive science students that I teach in Toronto, a lot of them are anti-representational pretty profoundly. But the thing that I find more trying is that even those who use the semantical vocabulary, as I mentioned, mean different things. They actually mean things in the realm of mechanism. So I can't tell them, I can't say, look, I think we need to consider the semantics of this system because the notion of semantics is used up in computer science for the relationship between the program and the process that results. And so therefore, I don't know what to say. I can say the semantics of the semantics of the program, but that doesn't always work. Um, it's kind of interesting. I also, when I was in graduate school in the early 70s, I, I wrote a little dialect of Lisp which had a model of reflection in it, which is a topic I'm still interested in, as are other people here. What could it be to actually construct a system that was able to reason about itself? The notion of aboutness, that it was reflective, was the notion of aboutness that I think real aboutness is, which is a non-causal denotative relationship to the self. And I actually arranged the causal, namely how the program worked, to honor this semantical account. And it was profoundly not understood. And I, for a long time, I didn't understand why. I mean, it could have been a bad idea, but it was profoundly misunderstood. And I couldn't have figured that out until I figured out that the word semantics and denotation and reference and all of those words, which I had picked up from you know, philosophy of mind and logic and so on and so forth, had actually been redefined within the causal <coughs> sphere. And what's happened, I think, and I'm going to close with this, is something I call blanket mechanism. This is my word. You, uh, I, don't, uh, I don't think anyone else uses it. But anyway, you, I just want you to know what I mean by it. So it's not just a commitment to scientific explanation. That would be a commitment that everything can actually be causally explained. It's a stronger thesis, and it's held a priori in the sense that the people I encountered actually believe it without having any evidence for it, that everything that exists is causal that in fact the world is restricted to the causal, not just that explanation is restricted, is, is, is not just the causal explanation is capable of explaining everything, including 
reference, but that there is no such thing as reference. And I tell you, when I teach about reference and I get people to realize how stunning it is, they all decide there's no such thing. And it's amazing. I tell them, well, look, you just met somebody three weeks ago, and you fall in love with them, and their high school sweetheart turns off, and they go off to Hawaii for four days or five days, and you're a total psychological wreck, and the person comes back, and you're just a mess, and you go see them, and you say, did you think about when you all had gone? And the person says, well, I don't know. There's no such thing as thinking about what my cortical cells moved around in this way, and so on and so forth. And I try to get them <laughs> just drenched in anxiety. But they still won't believe in reverence. And also, I think, and this is what's interesting, I think, even in the discussions this morning, my sense is that the words we use, like what's an observable phenomenon, and what's behavior, and what's information, and what's emergence in data, and what's operational things in themselves, evidence events, all of those words have been drenched, have been uh, dyed in blanket mechanisms, so they now refer, so an event is only the causal physical phenomena. It isn't doesn't include the semantical stuff, the truth, and so on, as it were. Um, the truth of a phenomenon is not the thing in itself, and so on. And I think observable stuff, so science studies people, they want to take video cameras, and Bruno Latour writes a book, Pandora's Box. Box. Is it called Pandora's Box? Anyway, he has this stuff at the beginning. I mean, it, it's so obvious if you call it Box, I decided it wasn't. <laughs> And he says, look, he's at the edge of this field in Brazil, and he has a video camera, and people are putting little samples of Earth into egg crates, and they're putting little plastic things. He doesn't see any reference there. He just sees patterns of circulating signifiers. And I say to Bruno, of course you don't see reference. Reference isn't causal. It's not going to impinge on the digital detector in your video camera. The fact that it doesn't detect on the sensor in your digital camera just means it's not a causally efficacious phenomenon. It doesn't mean it's not there. So anyway, I think those have all been torqued. Just in case you didn't know what I thought about blanket mechanism, I thought it would give you a little hint. <laughs> and so here's my moral for my house. I think that we should be aware of blanket mechanism. We should not be a priori committed to thinking that causal explanations of things will do justice to our phenomena. Because my sense is that awareness and consciousness and thinking about things and so on and so forth all partake of that lesson that was worked out in the formal context of logic that these things are not causal phenomena. And so I think if we inadvertently commit to blanket mechanism, we'll never understand awareness. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>so basically, contemplation, what is it? Well, usually translating, uh, especially some Asian contemplative traditions terms into English doesn't work at all. But contemplation works, it's a perfectly good word. The basic English definition of it means to look thoughtfully at something for a long time. <laughs> it's kind of funky, but um, it's okay. It works for some aspects of contemplation, and I'll give you some examples of that. It doesn't work for everything, though, and for that reason, I'll give you some examples of other things that involve quite different kinds of contemplative cognitions or types of awareness. Strangely enough, the word awareness is an even better translation of um, traditional contemplative terms uh, in, this, in this general area. Awareness is a good word, but you can only see why it's a good word and why it would cover all the different traditions after you've done them. So for right now, it's, it doesn't help us to talk about awareness. It would only be useful later. But I'll just mention it because Pete likes the word awareness and it comes up a lot. Eventually, it should do the job you know, for us without any trouble. So I'm going to give you some exercises, as I mentioned, and here it goes. These are fairly harmless. Most of them won't drive you too crazy. <laughs> uh, only two of them. Okay, so first exercise, this is where I want to start, is to contemplate the status of the self. 
a sense of self. Okay? So sit in whatever way you're comfortable with and get ready to do some strange things. Okay, sense of self. We take this and the related notion of a self in a situation, sort of a contextualized self, for granted mostly. We never notice this stuff. Um, but should we? Is there something about these things that upon examination can be seen to be unnecessarily limiting, constricted, disconnected, something problematical, let's say? That's the question. Can you see the sense of self at all? And if you can see it, can you see it as being limiting, improper, um, useful up to a point, but not beyond that? I mean, there are many possible things you might see. I'll leave that to you. There's a big range in the traditions, too. Is it too insular or disconnected from life in some way, social or other aspects of life? Can this self be questioned? given what I've just said. Can it be challenged? Can it be loosened or opened up in some way? These are additional contemplative questions. Or is it simply indubitable, unchallengeable? Just see what you can see. You have 75 seconds. Okay? 75 seconds. People spend 5,000 hours doing this, so don't worry. Seems a little difficult. Um, I wanted to start you here because this is the wrong place to start. <laughs> it's much too hard, it's quite odd, the question seems difficult to clarify or difficult to understand, it seems um, wrong-headed. The self is a useful thing in many ways, developmentally and in other respects. There are many perspectives you might have about this. but. Basically, the issue in the tradition is to have an incisive awareness that's fresh in some way. It doesn't just use the presumption of the self's role in order to evaluate or challenge the self's role. We are basically using the wrong tools from a contemplative point of view. So this exercise is no good. I gave you this not because I wanted to waste your time, but because eventually you need to become aware of what kind of mind you're using in a different context for a given purpose. Normally, you never, we just don't think about that. We just do stuff. But with contemplative practice, you want to know what kind of sensibilities, what kind of awareness am I bringing to the task? And if you're bringing the wrong one in, you will get the wrong answer, or a dull answer, or an unhelpful answer, or something like that. So that's what I would expect you to mostly get out of this. Maybe I will pre be proven wrong. We'll find out in the discussion section. But in any case, this is an important exercise when you have the right investigative type of awareness to bring to bear on it. Okay? How would you bring out more appropriate, more useful kinds of awareness that it could, ev could eventually be applied in this case, for instance? Well, we'll start at an easier case. Here's the next exercise. For this one, which is drawn from the Confucian tradition. Um, the idea is to simply consider, and now I'm really talking about that old <coughs> ordinary English definition of the word contemplate, in part at least. Um, your last day or your last week, say, one of those two things. What you did, to say, yesterday up to today, or what did you do over the last week? And just consider as many people have done <clears throat> in this kind of tradition over the centuries, um, how you interacted with other people during that time. Were you able to practice to bring into those engagements a certain kind of deference, and by which I mean an openness to the other person and the other person's humanity, not the other person's technical credentials or specialties, or um, something else, how much money the person has, or what influence he has over you, or whatever, but just the person's nature, status as a human being, and as being a person who's moving forward, hopefully, in life, trying to step more fully into his full humanity. That's part of the picture that the uh, Confucianists would have. Humanity is something we grow into, let's say. So it's something you're trying to mature into, something that other people are similarly engaged in, valuing. So how have you been in being open to the other person's humanity in your engagements with people, business, family, whatever relationships you might have? That's the question. 
follow-up part of the question is, did you notice that you didn't do it, that you actually were doing the opposite? You were kind of ignoring or disrespecting even those aspects of other people. You're basically oblivious to them or indifferent. If so, why? And how could you improve? How could you do something other than that? That's the question. 75 seconds. OK, sorry. Seconds. Um, what kinds of cognitions were you using to do this? What kinds of awareness were you using to do it? I basically already answered the question. Part of what you were using is just ordinary thinking, which is kosher. You know, it's appropriate. You get to think about this one. But you were also using memory, for instance. That's a specific kind of cognition. And that's a non-trivial point, because in higher contemplative practice, you're not supposed to be using memory for anything. Okay, Here you are. Yeah, I really mean it when I say that in these kinds of traditions, you really are point by point connected to what sort of things you're doing with your mind as you're doing them. That's never true ordinarily. You just spent the rest of the, the day today doing all kinds of intellectually challenging and dense, content dense things without considering what kind of mind was involved in that processing. Here you have to be. So you're using memory, you're using reflection or whatever, you're using judgment, you were bringing social conventions and uh, norms, values, those sorts of things to bear. You were basically answering the question of how you were doing partly by how other people would think of how you were interacting with other people. It's, that, it's so more a social perspective. Um, for that very reason, the sort of sparring partner of the Confucianists in Chinese history, Dao, the Taoists, would say, well, whatever it is you think you're cultivating here is not very fundamental. It's social conventions, basically. Conventional you know, sensibilities, morality, whatever. The Confucianists would say, yeah, probably it does start out that way. But in the kind of context that I'm teaching this stuff, some of them would go further and they would say, well, that's not by its, itself a, a trivial thing or um, a, a kind of artificial thing. And in any case, we are going to keep doing it. We are going to keep doing this exercise and then we're going to keep going out into the world and interacting with people and trying to use the benefit of our reflection to modify our interactions and then use the experience from the interactions to further enrich our reflections. And we're going to keep going until we actually cultivate a new more truly humane way of deferring being open to other people. This is what the Chinese would call it, virtue. You're actually cultivating a virtue. And it's not meant to be a goody-goody kind of term. It's meant to be something important that can be considered part of um, reality or something that should be included in a fully opened up sort of reality. Deference is a kind of openness. It's an initial form of openness. It's limited, but at its best, it could be the starting point for other kinds of contemplative openness. It would be extremely non-trivial. So in any case, that's the rationale for this. Let me give you another angle, okay, coming from the other side that was just so critical of the Confucianists. This is the Taoist angle. The Taoists are saying, well, you're trying to be open to people's humanity or your human nature. We don't care about that. What we care about is that you are a living being. So they want to really bring out types of awareness that are highly sensitized to being alive now, this moment, and whatever they can find about that aliveness dimension. So here's your exercise. You have 75 seconds to simply breathe. Don't be too bored or you know, run out of the room. This is not that, I'm that crazy. Just breathe as a way of um, focusing the fact that you are alive. Breathing is pretty much the central expression of your aliveness, on an outer level anyway. And we are pretty disconnected from it. It's a funny thing. It's something that usually happens automatically, but we can um, bring it uh, into our awareness and manipulate it. I don't want you to do that. Just breathe, participate in it as a door into aliveness, a way of entering into your, your living nature. This is the starting point for many other related kinds of ways of finding your existence. 75 seconds. Okay? 
this isn't a trivial thing to the so-called Taoists. Uh, most people think of Taoism as something that started with a text called the Tao Te Ching, but there are some scholars like Harold Roth and maybe some others who followed him that found an earlier text, what seems to be an earlier text than the Tao, than the Tao Te Ching, and it's just based on this exercise. It's not philosophical. It's obviously was produced by different people, and the emphasis was simply on using this as a door into a great deal of ex direct experience of things that people normally never notice and never fully inhabit in their life. But the basic Taoist idea is that if you can participate in this kind of breath and everything that it's connected to, and part of what it's connected to is just the presential quality of existence, just being present, um, that gives you the basis for another breath and then another breath. It's sort of a funny but possibly um, viable way of staying alive <laughs> when maybe your life is challenged for, for some reason. In any case, whether that's true or not, it's, it's an, an important part of your existence and it's usually one that we dismiss. It's just the body is a machine, we hope it keeps functioning so you can do the things you want to do. That's an incredibly strange idea, but we've become pretty much um, lined up behind it these days. So in this case, we are no longer thinking of ourselves as a social creature. We're thinking of ourselves as trimmed down to something pretty basic. We're just alive, and we're part of a living world. That's the other thing. So if you did this exercise again later at home, use it also as an entry into the living world. Just sit and look out the window or something and see that as part of your context. We do appreciate beautiful scenery, which is why this room is designed as it is, I suppose. But we are not intimately participating in it or connected to it as, as much as we could be. That's a fact, I promise you that. It's quite shocking just how much you can intensify your connection to the living world if you give it a chance. Okay, next exercise. This is drawn from Buddhism, but it's not so unusual. Um, it's pretty common in other traditions, too. This is another breathing practice, but here, the issue is not to really try to do much with the breathing, but to simply use it as a tether to being present rather than being distracted and settling down. But because you're just being present, you're not thinking about other things very much. You're also not worrying too much or being too stressed out. You're just following your breathing and using it as a tether or anchor to the basics of your existence, a basic, friendly, inclusive kind of calmness. You're just staying with whatever that suggests without a big agenda. So for instance, being calm is not the agenda. Forget trying to be calm. Just don't be too preoccupied with things that might disturb you. Even if you're, say, upset, you could just accept that as part of a more fundamental calmness. This actually has a meaning, a technical meaning in the tradition. It's a discovery of a part of your existence that is pretty accepting of things and present in the midst of them. Just use your breath as a tether to that. 75 seconds. I'm sorry about these time limits. It's just our numbers. We don't have much time. <coughs> Traditionally, people would probably spend three months just doing this, this, this one exercise, um, calming down. So what kind of contemplative practice is this? What kinds of awareness were you using that qualify as some sort of contemplative thing? The answer is probably none. This is not really meant to be a contemplative exercise. This is like a prerequisite for doing pre um, contemplative exercises. And I'm throwing it in because it's part of a kit that is needed. So this would be seen not so much as a way of noticing things, but as a way of, of finding in yourself a stable base for existing for perceiving, for being discriminating. But the, the exercise itself is just for the settling down and being grounded. Based on this, there would be many stages of teaching, all kinds of subtle things that would be much more like what was being discussed here by various people earlier in the day. These, te these contemplative traditions are quite technical. People typically spend 20 years of intensive kind of more academic study, at least in Tibet and other some other countries, before they even try to do contemplative practice. They actually just study a lot of logic, epistemology, various other things, just as a way of preparing for contemplative practice. And then they do 30 years of contemplative practice. You're doing 75 seconds. 
or something. So you can't expect too much, but anyway, we're doing something. So that was not a contemplative exercise. It was an attempt to establish a basis for contemplation. And then other things would follow. I'll only give you one more exercise, and it sort of represents something very far along. Okay, way at the end of, not at the absolute end, but closer to the end of a long series, say 20, 20 years or so of practice. Um, or a little bit of practice every day, say for a number of years. It, it, make it something realistic for you. So this is much more whimsical. This is called the iron ox. You've got this iron ox, a solid iron ox, okay? Not a living creature, just a block of metal. It's 10,000 miles high. Okay, it's a pretty big iron ox. From a physics point of view, I suppose this couldn't exist, actually. But anyway, we won't care about that. It's a 10,000 mile high iron ox. And you have a needle. How do you get the iron ox through the eye of the needle? It's very important. You have to think of this as a very urgent thing. These are soteriological traditions. So they see this as a, how do you save the iron ox? You know, how do you liberate him or something like that? How do you get this 10,000 mile high hunk of iron through the eye of the needle to contemplate it? Okay, that's our uh, time sessions. This is an example of a very different level of contemplative practice which very emphatically does not use any ordinary kind of cognition. You must have noticed that, I suppose. Um, maybe you tried to solve this problem mathematically or topologically in the, some clever logic trick or something. I don't know whether that helped you or not. Um, but why not try it? Um, you can try anything you like, but the only thing that will probably ever get that iron ox through is a different kind of awareness that does not involve an ordinary moving mind. Normally when we are using our intellectual capacity, our capacity to understand and create and so on, we're using a moving mind which we take as being the only possible way that the mind can work. There's another way based on higher order insights as we figure in certain mathematics and types of mathematics for example. Um, and there are other kinds of insights that uh, we are simply not familiar with, but which are natural, nevertheless. They're not strange um, artifices or, or, or um, ways of forcing us into some altered state or something. None of these, these traditional uh, emphases that I'm talking about are meant to be anything but natural. So there's something in our nature that is perceptive and aware of being part of a larger kind of um, dimension of, of um, presence, let's say, that solves this problem. And then based on that solution, basically not using a mind that thinks in terms of processes, causation, action and consequence and so on. If there's a way of thinking and understanding that's different from those ways of perceiving life, it would solve the problem. And then based on that, you could solve additional contemplative problems that would be part of a, a picture of uh, waking up, let's say. So anyway, these are my little case studies. If you try one or two of them at home, um, stick with the middle three. I've given you five very deliberately. The first one is hard and you can't do it without prepar preparation. The last one is impossible from ordinary points of view, okay? Meant to be impossible. But the way you solve the first one and the last one is by doing the middle three. If you learn to just take your interactions with other people as a profound moment, basically, full of values and import, something you can get better at. Um, that already, look at it functionally, that already is a way of opening up a very disconnected self, what the Confucians would call a small self or selfish self. It's a self that is basically in a holding pattern that's quite tightly held, tightly maintained. It's not really open. That would contribute to the first question about the self, for example, and how to open up the self. You can see a connection. The second one, the Taoist exercise, is about opening up to the rest of the world and the aliveness of it. That could contribute to the first question, too, if you give it a chance. The third one is about having a stable base, just in general. And you could use that for doing physics, if you want, or anything. Being able to be truly stable and present and not distracted 
worked well for Newton, for instance, it would probably work well for anyone. Any, any kind of intellectual endeavor would benefit from it, but also these other practices would as well. It's like the base or mount of a telescope. You have to have it. So if you put these three together, you can certainly solve the first question, and someday you can tackle the fifth one. So this is a very quick presentation of something people spend a lifetime on. Um, I'm giving you these things because they illustrate the importance of looking and seeing what you yourself are doing, not what I'm saying, just using ideas and so on that we share, words and concepts that we share. That's not going to help be very helpful. So maybe you can pick up some additional bits of it just by looking into it at home. But the basic point here is I'm not really trying to sell you on Asian ancient contemplative traditions. I'm just trying to point out aspects of your existence. You are a human being. You are a living being. You are mostly distracted, but you could be more stable. You know, There are lots of obstacles in the world, and some of them seem very daunting, almost as daunting, as difficult to solve as the iron ox problem. But they can be solved if you look at them in a different way, a radically different way. They can be solved. Life is full of problems that really defeat us, but they, they, don't, all, they don't all have to be like that. We have some additional options here. So my point is not to push traditions, it's just to point us out aspects of your own existence, your own human nature in relation to the world. And exactly what you do with this is, of course, up to you. But in closing, the only comment I would make before we go into our discussion is that we are the beneficiaries of um, science, various social science as well as physical sciences and computer science, of course, other kinds of information technologies. They're so successful that they seem to cover everything. Even the things that we say are somehow different, um, like the humanities and so on, are still capable of being analyzed as being instances of physical systems working according to the principles that science has elucidated. This is wonderful. I'm a big fan of science, personally. I'd much rather read about science than about contemplative traditions. Um, but I'd like to be the things that I've tried to illustrate through these examples. And science is not going to supersede um, the need for contemplation in that respect. No matter how much more science develops, you still have to appreciate your life directly. You can't do it entirely through the veil of a, a theoretical framework of some kind. That's simply not going to be fully adequate. It'll be extraordinarily useful. And in the future, we will have to discuss ways of bringing these two perspectives together, which is what Pete and I are working on. But you do have to have two. There's not just one here. There are two. So anyway, that's it. Uh, so why has it been an interesting journey? And actually, what I thought I'd do is, is go back in time. And uh, the reason for doing that is you know, the, the original idea wasn't called Why House. It was called something else. It was maybe a year and a half ago, I think, yeah. it, it started. Um, and then actually, a little over a year ago, in this very room, in March 2016, many of us were sitting around having one of the earliest discussions about the core research content, the intellectual content of White House. And I remember we went around the room, we all expressed questions that we were interested in, things that we would like to try to answer. Um, and White House itself was still coming into focus. Um, so what I thought I would do, and you know, I didn't know how this would turn out, is actually show you a few of the statements and slides that we had from that meeting and from a, a White House manifesto that we put together in the summer of 2016, not to show us that we're just saying the same things again, um, but as a sort of, you know, White House has undergone a certain stress test in the last 12 months. You know, we've, we've bashed, we've thrown these ideas against the wall, we've tried many different things. This, this discussion today has also been a piece of that. Um, and, uh, you know, what's remarkable, as you'll see, is how solid I think some of these ideas are, how persistent they are, the themes and motivations for White House. So let me just put up a couple of um, slides. So uh, this is something we discussed here in this room in March 2016. And I took you know, 
word for word the slide that I think it was I who showed this, but it was an attempt to summarize some of the things um, that we talked about. So here's what we were talking about over a year ago. So some of the most outstanding questions in modern science revolve around phenomena that are shockingly resistant to classical investigative methods. I think that is something that we've, we've heard a lot about today. Whoops, heard a lot about today. Um, big questions that we felt were within the realm of uh, Whitehouse's efforts were on the origins and nature of life and agency in the universe. So we've heard about that again today, the origins of awareness, cognition, and consciousness. Okay. Uh, the root properties of language, from genes to computation, and social organization, from bacteria to humans. And again, I think that's a theme that has resonated across the last 12 months, and we've heard more about it today. And this question of how these challenges are also reflected at the cutting edge of technological design innovation, the future of augmented human existence. You know, a year ago, we were talking a lot about the Internet of Things um, as an interesting new phenomena, technological phenomena that I, I think I like the idea of asking whether we're witnessing another origin event in some form. Okay, with the Internet of Things and, and the very rudimentary types of modern AI that we, we have now, is this something happening that hasn't happened um, before, well, it happened once before, four billion years ago, with the advent of biological living systems. There's something comparable to that happening now, something with the potential complexification um, that life has had. So this was interesting to me that these themes, I think, have run through for the last 12 months or so. Um, and also, because this question that we just talked about right now of action, of application, of taking what White House hopes to do in terms of um, extending and deepening our understanding of this thing we call awareness, but asking whether that had application to the world, to sustainability, to our lives. So we also wrote this, this manifesto about a year ago. It was written and rewritten many times and, and agonized over. And among the various pieces of that manifesto, we had these big questions. And I noticed big questions number four, <laughs> it's the end of the world. Um, is it possible to cultivate or engineer kinds of awareness that can help solve the critical challenges of human inequality, conflict, and environmental impact? <laughs> well, there's the answer. <laughs> Um, so, you know, so when you mentioned this idea of action a couple of weeks ago, it was interesting when I went back, and I only did this last night, you understand, but I went back and looked and I just thought, well, this is exactly what we were already beginning to think about, but I think it, it's becoming more focused, it's becoming better articulated. But then also, this was also, I copied verbatim, and information be seen as fundamental, as fundamental as, or perhaps even more fundamental than matter and energy. If so, what is the relationship between information, awareness, and consciousness? So, I think some of this speaks to sort of questions that Eric raised earlier um, this morning, and I think perhaps that you also raised. Um, so, we talked about nature, culture, technology, and reflection today as modules within. White House, and actually on the drive um, down here this morning, the co were talking about you know, module. Is module really quite the right word? And I, you know, I, we may need to debate that. <laughs> um, I think maybe sphere <laughs> is perhaps a better word. Does it really matter for the outside world? I don't know, but for our internal culture and, and how we internally conceptualize what White House is doing, it may matter. Um, so I have another quote, uh, again related to action, um, but also the picture of, of White House as an institute, as a place of learning, as a place of thought, of contemplation, um, addressing the impossible questions or questions that are impossible at the moment. So this is what we wrote <coughs> a year ago. Our ambition is to be a premier hub for activities addressing the fundamental phenomenon of awareness, the implications for human consciousness, human intelligence, and the human future. 
And what's so wonderful is I think we're still exactly right there, <laughs> but we've actually made some progress. Um, and in this room today, I feel that I've heard a lot of progress, a lot of deep, complex ideas. I, I will readily admit I did not understand everything that I heard today, but that is a good thing, right? Because I have something now to, to think about. Um, and I think that was it. Oh, yes. The grand ambition remains. So I think Ola, are these your sketches? Or almost. Uh, so, you know, our grand ambition is still that Lighthouse becomes a physical place. Uh, this was a little a rendering of ideas, rather ambitious ideas. I'm sure architecturally this would cost hundreds of millions of dollars, but you know, <laughs> let's think big, um, of a physical space that embodies all the things that we hold dear in terms of intellectual freedom, of walking in in the morning and having fun every day. I, mean, I think that was part of the original idea, Pete and I were sitting around and saying, well, what sort of place do we want that you go in every morning and that first conversation over coffee is what you think about for the rest of the day and you have fun with it every single day. But it, it's more than that, it's, it's fun that turns into something tangible. So the idea of a space that combines a public space, I use the public in the conventional um, <laughs> way there, um, but also research areas, administration, and so on, but, but to, to sculpt an environment, not just on paper, but in the physical world, that embodies all the things we'd like to do with White House. So I don't know if that's a really particularly good way to summarize <laughs> things. These were my closing comments. Um, that I think we've made a great deal of progress with White House, and today has been instrumental in, in pushing it on to the, the next level. So um, I hope you will all stick with us and, and keep helping us and keep involved, being involved, and we'd love to have you involved in everything that we do. It's great that your closing comments point to the opening of White House. So. <laughs> That's